All right. Well, welcome everybody to another session of Coaching Agile Journeys. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, we have more people coming in as they come, but uh, on behalf of my other co-hosts, I've got Raul and John here with me. Um, we're here to basically come together and learn during this period of time. So to make it the most valuable, um, Miles is going to be sharing with us in just a second, and, and I don't know if he'll share a screen or how he'll engage with us, but I do want to encourage you to, if you're comfortable, um, turn on your camera. That way he can see you as you're watching. We can see you. And then we normally have a very robust discussion over in the chat. You can chat here in the Zoom window, or if you like, there's also a Zoom or a, a chat happening over in LinkedIn. If you're connected on LinkedIn with our page, Coaching Agile Journeys page, we have a chat happening over there as well. If you do have a question for Miles and you want to capture it in the chat um, during his Q&A time, we'll look at those. You can put it in the chat here. Um, we have one of our co-hosts will be watching the chat over on LinkedIn if there's any questions happening over there. So that being said, Let's talk about Miles. Um, he's coming to us uh, today from, I believe, still Johannesburg. I don't think he's he's remote anywhere today. So home home base coming to us from Johannesburg. And he's going to be sharing with us celebrating the new abnormal, the Agile way. And, and Miles, I'll just say I'm so thankful that you're taking the time to come and share with us, this audience. Um, we really are all experiencing abnormal. And uh, I think what you have to share with us today is going to be a great fit for how do we adapt to what comes next. So uh, I know more people will be joining us as we go, but for now we've got a handful of people here. And I'll just say to everybody, if you want more events like this, make sure you visit us at coachingagilejourneys.com or follow our page on LinkedIn. Those are ways to see more events that happen uh, just like this. So that being said, Miles, we want to turn it over to you to, uh, to drive our conversation and our time together today. So thank you again for being here. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and uh, really good to be with everybody. I think that one thing COVID-19 has brought positively is just really built a global community that's just got so much closer together. Um, you know, we used to, I, I run the business agility uh, community in, in, in South Africa and, you know, monthly we would have fantastic events, but they were always in-person events, which, you know, means we'd get between 60 and 80 people that would come to these events, great speakers, great events. But with the way that it's gone now is we're able to connect with everybody globally. Um, and, you know, we even with our, our meetup group now, you know, whenever we, we still have uh, monthly sessions, uh, again, you know, really great speakers. The last uh, one we had, uh, Baz, uh, oh, I can't remember his surname, now, uh, a friend of mine organized a chat and he's sort of a, an explorer um, who who used the way that he prepares for exploration on, on the um, you know in the Arctic is the way that he you know in terms of helping us think about agile differences. Yeah, but before I go totally down a rabbit hole about our business agility community, let me talk to to this community. Yeah, um, and I think you know just to just to introduce again. So yeah, Miles Hopkins. I'm um, uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Be Agile, based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, we're very much a business agility consulting company, meaning that we don't just look at agile from the technology perspective. I'm not saying that everybody does, but a lot of organizations still think that agile only happens in technology. Um, and Evan Laybourne, who's the head of the Business Agility Institute out of, uh, out of Melbourne in Australia, will always say you can only be as agile as your least agile department. So we look at agility right across the value chain. We help uh, HR departments, finance departments. Obviously, we do the traditional um, agile uh, implementations as well. Um, we're, we're involved with a couple of really big projects in, in Africa. Um, and we work right across the globe. We're actually very fortunate that way. So I'm going to share, yeah, so I'm going to do a presentation. Hopefully I'll jump through this very quickly and then we can open up to some questions. Um, but I do think that it's important just to show what my perspective of why do, why do I first of all call it the new abnormal? Um, and then how does business agility play a role in that? So I'm just quickly gonna share my screen um, and get into the presentation. Okay, I'm just going to get this display settings right. Right, we should be good now. 
All right, so yeah, we um, we do a lot of work in the Agile community, just as a quick thing would be Agile. We last year, because of the work we did in the Agile community, we were a winner of the World Agility Forum Award. Um, and I was very involved in the Agile 20 Reflect uh, festival that happened over February. For those of you, I think a lot of you were involved with, you know, uh, attended that. Um, I know one of my colleagues from Cape Town is on here. I think Michael attended most probably about 600 of the 800 events that, that happened during this festival. Um, and it was just an amazing thing to see how a vision that Scott Seabright had in September last year when we were really just hoping to have 100 at the maximum 100 events became over 800 events through over 90 countries globally. Um, and, and everything was free. So yeah, I was very, very honored to, to be a trustee, um, ambassador and speaker for that. Uh, and you know, just hopefully it goes on to from strength to strength. So why do I call it celebrating the new abnormal? I think if you think about it right now, nothing is really normal about the way that we live at the moment. Um, depending of course, where you are, in which country, I was speaking to a colleague of mine in Australia today, um, and they had two new COVID cases in Queensland yesterday. And the, uh, the governor of Queensland put a hard lockdown in for three days. Um, and that's, that's the way Australia is dealing with, with COVID and they're doing it very successfully. But if you think about the, the abnormal, I mean, here we all now are very used to having meetings, uh, doing work, uh, you know, virtually. Um, and that's been in, in a way a positive there's abnormal that comes with that as well. And that's the stress that it puts onto employees in this new way of work. Um, and we need to deal with that into the future. So I don't see anything normal about the way that we currently work and the way business currently does business. Um, last year, towards the end of last year, I did my very first project in that I never ever face to face met the client. We did every single thing remotely um, and it actually worked out really well. So it's doable and I think everybody's realized that, that we can do this, but we need to understand how that impacts the humans on the other side of the camera all the time, especially those that either live in abusive households or are single and live by themselves. Um, it's, it's definitely something that is going to have a mental health challenge ahead for us. So we need to think about that. But let's look at it from a business agility perspective. So we're talking about COVID-19. Uh, the question is often asked was, was COVID-19 a black swan event? So for those of you who are not sure what a black swan event means, it means something that we couldn't have predicted. It came so far from left field that there's no ways we could have predicted it. But it wasn't a black swan event. In fact, Bill Gates, in a video in 2015 that had over 30 million views warned us about a pandemic that would be coming in the in the in the not too distant future and that the world was not ready for this so we were warned way ahead of time not only by bill gates but by many people that we could expect something like this and that the world was not ready for it and let's hope that into the future that we know we most probably going to land up with with more than just the one pandemic we might land up with one, two more, is that we learn from our mistakes that we've made over the last year. Um, a very good uh, statesman for South Africa, um, a guy called Jan Smuts, uh, way back at around the right World War, World War, just before World War II started, said the one thing that we learn from history is that we never learn from history. And I really hope that that's not the case, but I don't hold out a heck of a lot of hope that, um, that, that that's not gonna be the case. We can't even manage the current pandemic we're in, never mind any future ones. I mean, we've just got too many people, too much fake news out there, too much you know, misinformation that's going out. So hopefully into the future, we do manage it better, um, but I'm not holding my breath. So if you have a look at the effect that uh, a pandemic like or a, a big event like COVID-19 has on, you know, the, the stock market. So this is indicators from the S&P 500. And I will send this presentation to you guys um, after this talk so that you can have a look at these figures. But you'll see that COVID-19, now this, uh, you know, was only sort of about a year ago. So it's not the latest effect, but it only at that stage had sort of like a 20, you know, 29 percent negative effect on the stock exchange whereas you've seen other 
areas that are having a much bigger effect. But if you look at the block on the bottom right, it shows how quickly the uh, Wall Street was able to react to these and grow above what they were pre the pandemic. Um, and I think, you know, with the, the, the one point, what's a $1.9 trillion stimulus bill in the USA and various other uh, stimulus bills that have happened all over the world, that's really helped the economies grow quite a bit. And on the next couple of slides, well, the next slide, we'll see how this is, is predicted to change. So this was 2020. You'll see the slide automatically changes to 2021. And I wanna, I'm gonna wait for it to come back to 2020. Because when you have a look at 2020, we obviously see a heck of a lot of red. So that means many economies just shrunk massively. Um, and, and we understood that. But in 2021, we see the predictions is that they'll grow a lot more. Um, and in fact, these predictions are quite conservative. Looking at the latest statistics, it seems like they're gonna get even better and better and better. So over the next couple of years, we're gonna see the economies in various countries just growing rapidly. The, the main point I wanted to bring up with this, though, this, these particular slides, is that whilst these economies will grow rapidly, we need to understand that they're not necessarily going to grow in those, those traditional industries that were in place pre-COVID. So we're seeing a big change in the way, in, in those industries that are really starting to do well now, versus those that are the biggest losers. So you can't, you most probably can't read this at all. That's it's it's mainly here for for um, impact. But it's just to say that when you have a look at the winners that came out of COVID nineteen, it's companies like Shopify, Asaraport, Nvidia. It's companies that are in the online shopping retail space. It's companies that are in the tech space. We're all on Zoom today, and we're seeing you know Zoom. I think within the first three or four months of COVID-19, their, their share prices went up like 400%, um, and they've just grown rapidly. So the point behind these is to, to a large extent to say, when we say that it's the new abnormal, the world industry map has changed. The, the businesses that maybe used to do well in the past, pre-2019, are not those that ne will necessarily do well into the future. The, you still see the, the Microsofts and the Amazons and the Googles there, but they're the guys that are, are in the tech space. So it's the tech companies that are gonna really start doing very well. And then you're looking at the bottom there, the losers, the oil and gas, the um, diversified banking, the real estate, the airlines, um, aerospace. Those are the types of industries that are going to struggle into the future. It doesn't mean that they're gonna go out, that, they, that we don't need them. It just means that all companies today, and that's gonna be the main point behind my talk, and we'll get onto it in a little bit more specific detail later on, is that we've got to understand what's changed and we've got to talk about anticipating and adapting to the change and making sure that we can do that quicker than our, our competitors so that we're able to secure our futures. Just a last uh, slide on, on, on this particular uh, train of thought is, you know, these are a lot of industries. And if you have a look at them, the top six industries there, semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, personal products, software, technology, hardware, they have grown by an average of $275 billion over the last few years. Whereas the bottom companies, which again are your banks, your uh, financials, your utilities, your energy companies, have dropped by a combined 373 billion. So one thing that's interesting here is, is, is the banking industry, both on the previous slide and this slide, um, because we all know that the banks do really, really well. And in, in Africa as well, we know that our banks do really, really well. But the fact of the matter, if I just talk about Africa, for example, we're a population of about 1.3 billion people in Africa. So roughly the same size as India or China, but 80% of our population in Africa is unbanked. Means they don't have a formal bank account and they are being serviced by the smaller FinTechs, the companies that are able to create mobile uh, money solutions that don't necessarily need a formalized bank. And when companies are looking at their competitors and how they, you know, eke out a share in their markets, most of them will look at their traditional competitors and say, okay, 
then say, okay, we have five big banks. So those five big banks will look at each other and say, okay, well, how do we how do we beat the other four big banks? But they should be looking at that. But what they should also be looking at is those fintechs and um, insure techs, etc., that they don't even know exist currently that are coming to eat their their lunch at the end of the day. So Klaus Schwab is the founding executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. He says in the new world, it's not the big fish which eats the small fish, it's the fast fish which eats the slow fish. So traditionally it was all the big companies that really just bought out or, or crushed or through uh, you know, uncompetitive practices, beat out all the smaller companies. But today it's more about how those small, not necessarily small companies, but it's about who gets to fastest to the market. And obviously, you know, most of you here are, are agilists and this will resonate with you because you know that one of the big things that we're trying to do in agile is we're trying to speed up the delivery to, to the market. We're trying to speed up delivery of products and services to the market. And this plays right into our wheelhouse when we're saying now it's the fast fish which eats the slow fish. Uh, when COVID kicked in last year in South Africa, my consulting company literally lost millions of dollars overnight in, in training, um, you know, workshop revenue, uh, consulting revenue. But one of the things we knew is that we would be well placed for the future because prior to that, when you're trying to sell consulting services or consulting into your company, you've either got to find a CEO that truly believes in it or you've got to find a burning platform. And now all of a sudden, every single company had a burning platform. And in terms of this adaptability and adjusting to the new markets, it reminds me of a, a, um, a, a story I saw on CNN not long after COVID kicked in in the USA. And there was a brewery that, you know, traditionally made its beer and, and had its alcoholic processes. And they immediately changed their model to uh, um, producing sanitizers and disinfectants uh, because they suddenly saw a big need for that come COVID-19 um, and they changed their model and, they, and they've done exceptionally well with that. That's what we talk about adapting and adjusting to your market. It didn't mean that beer all of a sudden wasn't necessarily going to do well, but these guys saw that disinfectants and sanitizers would do better. And so they changed their market to do that. One of the problems we face in organizations today, and Rita McGrath says, and now for those of you, I'm sure most of you know who Rita McGrath is, but she's basically the modern day Michael Porter. Not saying that Michael Porter is not relevant anymore, but Rita talks about saying we are working with outdated tools and assumptions. And if you have a look at the right hand side, um, this is commonly referred to this, it's an, actually an extended ver version of what's commonly referred to as Martex law. Now, what Martex law says is that the speed of change in the waves of innova innovation over the last you know, few, few uh, years, let's say last 15, 20 years, has been exponential. But the problem we face is that the way we manage businesses has not changed a heck of a lot over the last 50 years. And there's a widening capability gap between the way that we manage businesses and the speed at which our industries are changing. And it's not going to get any better. Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, um, he all, at 2018 at the World Economic Forum said, today is the fastest the world has ever changed, but this is the slow, slowest it'll ever change into the future. So it's just going to get faster and faster. And that capability curve is going to get bigger and bigger unless we do something about it. And I'm sure most of you, if you are agilists or agile coaches, will know that in the worlds that you belong in, your biggest problem is not necessarily the agile way of doing things. It's because the rest of the business, particularly at a leadership and management level, haven't changed the way. They haven't unlearned their old ways of doing things and learned new ways of doing things. I often say to HR, heads of HR, is you know, for, for many years, um, HR has always demanded their seat at the executive table. And I've said to them, well, in the, in the world of agile and in the new world of work, not only will you have a seat at the table, you should actually be setting the table because HR to a large extent plays one of the biggest roles in enabling agility in the organization. 
So it's not so much about how they use Agile in their own department, but how do they enable Agile across the rest of the business? Changing the way they recruit, changing the way that they do organizational design, changing the way that they reward performance manage, uh, changing the way we do leadership development. That's the key things that are going to change. And so many things have to be unlearned there, um, particularly on performance management. You know, I've often have the debate and then I say, but, you know, I still want to score the person at the individual out of five, even though I understand that teams are more important than individuals. And when I say to them, but why do you want to score them out of five? What's the rationale for that? They find it difficult to answer that, but they're finding it difficult to unlearn as well. So what are, the, what are companies struggling to do at the moment? They're struggling to deliver significant organic growth. They're struggling to innovate at a pace with legacy 20th century structures and cultures. And never mind the, the, the structures and cultures, a lot of what makes the banks, particularly in South Africa, now, you know, one will say, well, so what about the banks in South Africa? Our banks are in the top in the world. We, we're well known globally for our banking systems. In fact, in the last year's um, an analysis, the two one of our banks was the third best brand in the world and the other bank was the fourth best brand in the world. But one of their biggest slowdowns from an agile perspective is their legacy systems like their SAPs and their Oracles, their ERP systems, because they've spent literally billion, not billions, millions and millions of dollars on putting these legacy systems in place. And they don't want to just push them aside and start putting in place much more flexible, agile uh, technologies that help us deliver at speed because of the amount of money that they've spent. And one of the key principles that we talk about in agile is ignore sunk costs, but it's difficult to ignore a sunk cost when it's cost you so much. And then balance delivering results today with the investing and innovation for tomorrow. Again, you know, if you've got shareholders, they're wanting to see the results this year. They're not so worried about what's going to happen in the next four to five years. But you as an executive needs to worry about what's going to happen in the next four to five years. So they need to balance that. Adopting new ways of working. I think COVID-19 has pushed us a lot towards adopting new ways of working. But that now needs to be balanced out as well. Um, you know, it's, it's not all working smoothly and we need to balance out the new ways of working. Finding the capacity to drive the strategic change and innovation they know they need. So we look at three buckets of work here, which is run, grow, and transform the business. Run the business is your day-to-day -day operations. Grow the business is growing your market share, growing your regional footprint in terms of your current products and solutions. And, um, and transform the business is literally where you, you either disrupt or you be disrupted. Um, so you need to have a look at totally new ways of new, total new products, total new ways of doing things. And most companies are running at about a 95% run the business, five, about 4.5% grow the business. And if we're lucky, half a percent transform the business. Whereas we're saying to them they should be running 60% run the business, 20% grow the business, 20% transform the business. And then de develop cohesive strategy to solve these collective challenges. We are starting to see a bigger move towards um, ecosystem or platform businesses where you know we realize as a business we can't do everything ourselves so we start uh, actually partnering or or purchasing or acquiring companies that have the capability we need to be everything we can be to our clients so with emerging recipe for success is business agility you can have a look at most magazines, you know, uh, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, McKinsey. I know there's some people that are very against McKinsey and um, I'm not going to talk about the company themselves, but they have some fantastic articles in their, in their Agile collection. So if you haven't been there, go across to their, uh, you know, their Agile collection and it's all free. Um, you know, you just uh, subscribe. I get some really great stuff from them. But you're starting to see Agile hitting many, many more headlines in the newspaper you can most probably go into most companies' strategies and they'll talk about them being an agile organization. You can go into most CEOs and, and executives' um, job descriptions and it'll say agile, 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 but very few of them actually are. So if business agility is the recipe, then what are the ingredients? A deeper, more nuanced understanding of your customer. I find it so surprising today that 
how many companies still don't have somebody that's either a CXO or somebody that at an executive level, at a C-suite level that focuses on the customer as the center of what we do. You know, there's again, big companies out there, well-known companies that haven't done customer journey maps, haven't done customer personas, haven't done customer empathy maps, yet they're still making money, but that's going to change over time as you, as your customers become more and more powerful, which they already are, but you need to get to understand them really, really well. Accelerated experiment driven innovation. We have to be continuously innovating to stay ahead of our competitors, not only our big competitors, but those competitors we don't even know exist right now. Improved prioritization, simplified delivery and tech enabled efficiency. I'll just stick on the prioritization. Again, seeing in a lot of organizations, big organizations been being agile for a while, they still struggle to prioritize the work that they need to, to deliver on, the work that brings the most value to the customers, to the organization, to the employees, et cetera. And then there's, when we put in simplified delivery through agile processes, which is, you know, agile frameworks, which is fairly simplified, then we start complicating it again by putting in too many layers of uh, governance and management, et cetera. Evolved approaches to leadership and culture, core technology and agile ways of working. I just want to touch on the leadership part here. You know, we, we, we sit there and we say that leaders must move away from command and control and become servant leaders. That's easier said than done. First of all, we don't give the leaders their psychological safety to first of all understand where they are on that continuum between command and control and servant leadership. Um, and so we, we don't let them understand where they're at. And then we don't give them the psychological safety to themselves develop to become much more of a servant leader. And then finally, the, the straw that breaks the camel back, and this comes back to HR enabling the, the agile across the business, is we in, then we start incentivizing them on command and control behavior rather than on servant leadership behavior. And we must understand that certain leaders will never become servant leaders. I always talk about and say, you know, there's in certain instances, you just cannot make turn a hyena into a Labrador. Uh, and you need to understand that sometimes those people, maybe they don't lead if they've got great value to their business, then we use them for the value they can bring, but it's not a leadership position. And then real insight in term, real time insights. So again, you know, the whole business intelligence thing, We've known about it for years. There's massive amounts of data available, but I, I still, I still don't see enough business intelligence that is helping organisations make the right decisions at the right time, um, and and pivot where they, maybe they need to pivot. So we need to start building up again and start really making sure that our business intelligence becomes a business wisdom to a large extent. It starts helping us make the right decisions. So what are the targeted outcomes? Increased customer satisfaction and loyalty. Accelerated innovation solutions for real world challenges. We obviously should be increasing revenue, margins, market share, profitability. Increased strategic alignment and adaptability. One of the things that I, I again find companies really struggling with is the whole concept of lean portfolio management uh, linked to OKRs, um, where we start linking all the work that needs to be done in the business to the strategic uh, intent, uh, to the strategic initiatives, through value streams. Not necessarily that we want to create too much bureaucracy, but we want everybody to have a line of sight as to what they're doing, why they're doing it, and, you know, and, and what the outcome should be. Simplified delivery structures and practices, improved collaboration, improved adaptive core tech capabilities and increased employee engagement and empowerment. One of the things that we do realize that companies that are really agile and are pushing it really well is that the employee engagement goes up radically. So here's a definition of business agility. It's uh, been put together by Evan Laybourne, who I said is the head of the uh, Business Agility Institute in Australia. Sally Alatu, who's an amazing um, uh, entrepreneur and agile, she uh, started and runs a company called Agility Health in America and myself. Uh, it's the ability to anticipate and adapt to change, learn and pivot, deliver at speed and thrive in a competitive market. 
because gone are the days when big eats small, today fast eats slow. The ability to disrupt, learn and deliver faster than competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. And we can see some of the results that are coming through. Um, sorry, I'm putting my glasses on for this one. Now this comes from the Scaled Agile website. So again, I'm not trying to push Scaled Agile here. I'm going to put my hand up and say I am a safe program consultant and my business partner is the only uh, SPCT in the whole of Africa and the Middle East. But we don't, we don't drink the uh, Kool-Aid. We all say we don't drink the safe Kool-Aid. We, we do what works for the clients. And it's much more important about being agile than doing agile. But these come from real case studies. And the results were 30% happier, more motivated employees, 50% better, faster time to market, 50% defect reduction, and 35% increase in productivity. I mean, what C-suite doesn't want that at the end of the day? So, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that we, we understand the benefits of Agile and leadership needs to understand that. There's some case studies of companies that have, uh, that, that, you know, from these case studies, and we'll see they're not all tech companies. There's some banks there. There's, um, there's uh, Accenture's there, PepsiCo, AstraZeneca. Maybe we shouldn't be mentioning AstraZeneca at the moment, but they're there. Air France, KLM. Um, so yeah, these, these are companies that have used this uh, and, and are doing really well. Uh, there's some government agencies as well. So what are the problems we're solving for? I'm almost done with the presentation part, then we can go into discussion and Q&A. Um, ineffective team design and cross-team dependencies. So one of the big, we run a, a business agility workshop, for a business agility strategies workshop. And one of the pillars we drive there quite hard is the whole thing of org design because it's not just about teams or teams of teams. You've got to start looking at, you know, enablement teams and maybe dual track agile where you have one track that's doing discovery and another track that's doing delivery. Um, there's various ways of structuring the business. Um, competing business priorities, uh, limited voice of the customer. I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, tech versus business teams. Tech is sprinting while org is still stuck. Leaders still using command and control. Okay, just... So, okay, so welcome to the world of hyper innovation. Intellectual capital is more important than physical or monetary capital. Boundaries are blurred. New products can be created more cheaply and faster than ever before. Markets are getting bigger, but they're also getting smaller. And what do we mean by that? We mean by that markets are getting bigger and that you can sell your, your products anywhere in the world. But where are they getting smaller? It means that you're actually getting more and more competitors and you've got to become more focused on what you sell. That's why it said the diversified banking companies will struggle into the future. Decide what, you, what you're really good at and sell that. Don't be everything to everyone because that's where you're most probably going to fall short. Markets are faster and more efficient and the lifespan of even the most innovative and successful product is shorter than ever before. The lifespan of companies is shrinking. Every industry, company and product will undergo significant change or face disruption into the near future. And you are next. Every single one of us. You've got to make sure that you're getting ready for that next. Not only as as companies, but as individuals, do you have the skills and capabilities that the new world of work needs? And obviously agile coaching is one that I believe is very much in that space. Agile consulting is, um, you know, you, you, you need to say, can a computer do what I do? And if the answer is no, then you're in a good space. Final slide, ladies and gentlemen. So we developed this impact model. I'm not going to go through it in much detail, but what we did for this, and I don't even know if it's a model or a framework, but what I wanted to do is like we went to, we go into clients quite often, they call us in to do their agile transformation for them. We recently started with one in Nigeria, and then we hear that there's another team that's working on the strategy of the business, um, and the two teams are not connected. But the odd thing is, obviously, as you know, is who's going to actually implement the strategy at the end, end of the day? It's the agile teams. So those are the ones where the, you know, suddenly we've got the value streams and we're the ones that need to actually implement this. So the idea behind this model, I'm going to call it a model, but it's not really a model, is that we, we, we said you need to understand everything that's going on in your business with a customer at the center. Make sure the strategy and the innovation and the product development that they imagine 
is connected to the way that you prioritize the work and the funding in your organization, which is connected to the way you deliver work in the business, connected to the way that you look at adapting and connected to your employees, which is at the captivate level. And then finally a transform. So yeah, a very, uh, I know that was a, a mouthful. I'm gonna stop sharing and then we can have a discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Miles. And just to facilitate our question and answer session, um, if you do want to talk and someone's maybe already asking the question or, or there's something going on, you can use the raise hand feature inside of Zoom and we'll take people in that order. Or you can put your questions down in the chat and uh, we can discuss those. So uh, questions maybe for Miles, anybody have any they want to bring up? I'll raise one that was in the chat while we maybe build a queue. Uh, Miles, someone raised a pretty good question i thought how do you see what you shared with us here right you were talking about kind of how businesses need to pivot and, and move how do you see that applying in a nonprofit or maybe even a government sector applying to those different you know if their goal is not just profit how do you see these same ideas applying in, in that area no very good question and i think that so i think one of the things that that i see in the u.s for example is that you know, the government, a lot of the government departments are, are using Agile. Uh, how successfully, I'm not sure. Um, that may be a little bit more difficult in the African context because we've got various other things to deal with. But to come to the question itself, I would think right now, particularly with what's happened with COVID, with the fact that we've got a lot of people working from home, the fact that we've, in fact, I was watching a, a, a documentary I don't know if you can actually call them documentaries anymore because this one was on CNN. So, you know, Fox would say that's not a documentary. <laughs> that's, that, that's fake news. Um, where they were, were saying, you know, again, COVID-19 hit the, the, the sort of middle work, well, the working class people a lot harder than it hit the graduates. Let's call it the graduates because the graduates could work from home because most of their jobs are knowledge workers are, you know, office bound, they can work with Zoom. If you're somebody that's, um, you know, uh, working on a farm or a truck driver or whatever it is, you can't work from home. So I think the governments need to understand what is it that, and I'm not going to use the U.S. government necessarily as, as the example here, but what is it that the impact that COVID has had on every single country in the world? What has it had on our population? How do we start putting ourselves in a position to actually make sure that our citizens are doing a lot better into the future. How do we start using, you know, one of the, one of the uh, service offerings we do is, is, is automation. So how do we start automating things a lot better within organizations? And of, of course, Agile can come in there and really help with the, the whole automation side as well. But it's about new, it's, it, I don't think it's about the traditional service offerings that governments used to give us. It's about new ones. Um, even nonprofits, you know, maybe a nonprofit was had a, had a certain purpose pre-COVID. Maybe they have a different purpose now. And what are those, um, you know, service offerings that they're offering to the people that they serve? Um, and, and, and how do, you know, so it's, it's, this is not about money anymore. It's about, and I think for every organization, it's about remaining relevant, whether you're financially relevant or you are, um, you know, uh, operationally relevant as a nonprofit organization. I think you're on mute, Isaac. Yeah, I was pointing over at Raul. I see that hand over okay. there. Go ahead, go ahead and <laughs> jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks so much, Miles, for the discussion so far. Um, one of the points that I wanted to ask about is for business leaders, right, I think there were some comments in the chat about how, you know, sometimes the executives who should be customer obsessed maybe are not so much, right, and they're focused on running the business. The question I have is, you know, when you're working, let's say, for you know, a company like Zappos, right, where everything is kind of funneled towards one specific thing, it becomes very easy to kind of point the whole organization in one direction. When you're working in a large organization, mid to large size, more used to command and control leadership, right, and there's competing priorities, competition for resources amongst the business leaders, how do we as agilists, as champions of, you know, agility, 
how do we deal with that situation where we need that coordination, that alignment, and everybody to kind of think in that um, customer obsessed way? Yeah, thanks, I love, I, also, I love that question. I think that, um, I think, I think you, you're, not, you're not gonna win the war without winning a whole lot of battles. So I think what you got to, what I mean by that, you've got to find those parts of the business where, where it's, it's much, not necessarily easier, but where you've got champions, people that want to go the agile route. Um, but they have to have executive sponsorship. So it needs to be somebody at the C-suite level that says, um, you know, I'm quite happy. Let's go for my division. I'm happy to, 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 to go this route. And it needs to be driven from the C-suite level. Um, and then as people start seeing the success of that particular business unit or division, then hopefully the rest of the business starts. So start showcasing what it is. And it may be one division, it may be two divisions. I think one of the things that I find quite, quite difficult in certain of our clients is, and, it, and, it, and it's sort of like, which one is right and which one is wrong? So a lot of the divisions that we have, and when I talk divisions, I talk about uh, product divisions. So this like a bank, you know, one is doing, um, you know, home loans and the other one is doing personal banking and whatever it is, is that generally the heads of those, that's sort of like quite a federated model. So each of the leaders of that business division sort of runs their own business. So they're not, you know, they're not necessarily have to abide by what the holding company says. But again, you know, just find who is willing to go that route, find your, find your champions, Drive the champions. I'm sure many of you as agile coaches, I can't remember what the video is called, but you see that you might have seen this video where you know one idiot starts dancing in the in the field and everybody starts laughing at them. And then suddenly another couple of idiots go join dancing in the field. And eventually everybody that's in the field is dancing because that one idiot started dancing. Okay. Um, and and I think that that's where we, what we've got to try to do. And I think the other things that we must, whilst I said, you can, you can, well, Evan said, you can only be as agile as your least agile department. We must also understand that every part of the business may have a different way of being agile, not necessarily having to implement an agile framework, not necessarily having to go, you know, your team, team of teams level, um, you know, so that you'll have different org structures. And I think this is also where HR departments struggle is that I, I don't have a one size fits all, uh, solution to one business. I now suddenly have to have a different way of doing org structure for this part of the business, a different way of doing org structure for that part of the business. And by that, I also then start to have different reward systems for different parts of the business. So never mind now I have to almost do a 180 degree turnaround in the way I've always done things as an HR director. I now have to have various solutions for parts of the business. So again, to come back to your question, I mean, you guys have, have Obviously, we're similar, even though we're not agile coaches. We, the only way we get customers is by convincing people that they need to go agile. Um, and we don't try to turn the whole business around. We, in fact, we, we quite categorically say to them, do, especially if it's a big business, don't try it for the whole business right now. Let's pick the one that's most ripe for, um, for, for, for agile right now. Let's go with that. Let's prove, let's learn our lessons, but make sure you showcase it across the rest of the business so the rest of the business can see what's going on. Thank you, Miles. I appreciate that answer. Um, I think Joel is up next. Uh, okay, whoops, I just realized my camera's not on. Am I here? Yeah, you are. There, there you are. are. You're loud and clear. Great. So I feel like I'm going to hold up the loyal opposition here, which good. Isaac well, may not good. be too <laughs> surprised by. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a tilt. I'm just going to make an observation. There's a tilt in the agile community to stand back and say, somebody else needs to have solved this problem. And I think that's our failing, hmm. right? The fact that managers, leaders aren't on board, that they're not having the discussions that they don't understand it's not their fault. If we're not willing to do what it takes to get in front of them and have those really difficult discussions, who will? We're the people who are best prepared to do that, maybe. 
Um, and I guess the other part that I wanted to bring is um, I very often hear people going after this from a, I need them to buy into agile perspective. And I believe that at least from my experience, the only times this works is when I'm serving their interests and helping them accomplish their goals. Hmm. Because otherwise, Agile is an impediment, whether we want to think about it that way or not. So I guess I just, you know, it's if we're trying to help them, unless we're trying to help materially advance the business in a way that matters, rather than just, oh, you should pedal the bicycle this way instead of that way, we should expect to be ignored if that's the discussion we're having. Yeah. So I guess that's just, that's the way I approach this with leaders is to really sit down and say, okay, can I understand why it works this way? Why do they believe the system works better the way it is? And can I actually demonstrate a material improvement according to the rules of the game as the company is currently structured so that they can get a path forward? If not, then I feel like it's on me to figure out what that path might look like rather than telling them that they're doing it wrong. Um, I mean, as a quick, quick example, doing some work with a retailer in the area as a, as a uh, data warehouse guy, the project, and, and there's a big discussion about starting to do analytics with Tableau. And they believe it or not, even, you know, five or 10 years ago, they weren't. Everything, you know, every week there was a 70,000 page print paper run that would show up on the product manager's desks. Ended up in a discussion with a CIO who said, okay, Joel, understand. We just, this is just after the big last recession. We just went through the biggest recession we've seen, not the most recent, the one back away. We just went through the biggest recession that anybody's ever seen in recent history. We gained customer base. Our profitability went up. Our primary competitors are almost out of business. My, my, my IT spend is a third of my competitors. Are you actually standing here telling me you think I'm doing it wrong? I think, Joel, one of the things that you raised so critically there is you seeing your executive as your customer. Right. You're getting to understand your customer really, really well. And right. you're getting to meet their needs. And I think a lot of people... Because otherwise, talking, all we're doing, if I could, all, otherwise, all we're doing is trying to shove something down their throat. No, for sure. And a yeah. lot of people, you know, take an agile framework and and try and panel beat that into the business. And that's not a, that's, that's doing agile rather than being agile. So yeah. I think again, in terms of my, what you most probably saying to uh, your, 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 your client is, well, yeah, you may be, you know, doing this better than your customers but, or your competitors, but there's opportunity to even be better than that. And this is right. how we can do it. So we're yeah. not, we're not questioning that you've been doing it wrong. We're just trying to, so that there yeah. may even be better, you know, room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. Right. But and whether you I, frame I, it as the positive room for improvement or, yeah. hey, that's great that that's working really well. Yeah. In that case, where are your pain points today? Yeah. And how can that's I map what Agile cool. can deliver to those directly rather than some abstract thing they don't care about yet, whether I think they should or not? No, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. thanks for letting me talk. No, no, thank you, Joe. Excellent. Joel, so Brian, I see, I see Brian's hand there with a with a question. Go ahead, Brian. Jump in. Here. You can't, please don't let Brian on. Um, Brian, I was best man at Brian's wedding. <laughs> I don't know how many years ago, and him and I used to share a uni uh, uh, room at university. So, um, oh, no. hey, Brian, how you doing, my friend? <laughs> uh, Isaac, can you please mute Miles? <laughs> Hi Miles, nice seeing you, yeah. and uh, thank yeah. you. As as uh, per normal, very good insights. Uh, um, it's always great having a chat with you. I learn a tremendous amount. I particularly uh, took note of the analogy of uh, laughing at someone using a ninety-five computer. Not because I have one, but. Uh, um, and it makes a lot of sense and then applying that to the HR field and uh, I, I think a lot of theories and, and, and so on um, need to be revisited. And uh, in the work that I do, I, I spend quite a lot of time with uh, HR practitioners trying to uh, unskill the, uh, the rote learning that they, they learn to, to get through the exams. But notwithstanding that, um, something that I've noticed uh, during the 
beginning of the second year of, uh, of the pandemic is that two significant um, points that I picked up. One of them is that the people in this room are not representative of the norm in society. The fact that you're involved in agile, agile thinking and so on is that you are uh, thinking ahead and are, are preparing the way. Um, and I think that we've got to find ways in which we can bridge the communication between the highfalutin language we use and the and the examples and so on and bring it bring it to reality. And the second point that I've noticed is that um, the basic needs and the basic characteristics of the human have not changed. As much as technology has changed and society has changed, um, of course, there's a veneer of, of, of new thinking. And I mean, we've been very clever about naming the, the times in which you were born as uh, d determining almost your personality. I think when I was a youngster, they used this the month you were born. Now it's like the decade you were born in will tell you, tell people how to treat you because you're thinking that. And it's and it's pretty much a, a mechanistic way of looking at, at people. And, and I think we've, we've, we're really losing some of the individuality and the need to actually remember that at the end of the day, it's individuals and individual thinking um, that uh, that uh, holds, holds sway. I'll just... Uh, Appreciate your, your thoughts on that. And thanks for, it was almost 40 years ago, Miles, for doing that job and uh, keeping me <laughs> yeah. calm at the altar. Yeah, no problem, my friend. Good to see you again. Um, so, so I think, Brian, if we're going to go to that second part first, I think that one of the, so, so we, as soon as I start talking about automation, people start looking at me as I'm the devil because we're destroying jobs. The fact is that uh, the World Economic Forum has said that um, more jobs will be created out of uh, for our, for fourth industrial revolution than destroyed, and it's about under again, like you're saying, about understanding the people because those are individuals that are now knowledge workers. And one of the things that again I speak to organisations about from a HR perspective is that instead of doing an employee value proposition, which is a broad value proposition for every single employee in your business. Have those boundaries, have those, those frameworks, but at the end of the day, you need to start looking at individual value propositions. What is it that, that attracts Brian, uh, Isaac, Joel, Kristen, Johan? What is it that, uh, sorry, I'm just reading all the people's names at the top of the screen. Um, is, uh, you know, what is it that attracts them and, wants the, and, and, and makes them wanna work for me? How many hours a day do they wanna work? What's important to them? Um, uh, Josh Burson, uh, not so long ago, it's only about 18 months ago, did this thing about employee benefits. Uh, so one of the things we can, you know, customize around is employee benefits. And um, Brian will understand that I, I don't have children, but I have four dogs, which are my fair kids and cost me more money than most people's children would. But one of the top things that was an option for people was what was called paternity leave. So if you, your dog's sick or you've got a new puppy or whatever it is, you actually get days off instead of paternity leave. But the reason I'm using some silly examples is we do, we do need to individualize it, right? Um, again, understanding that we're talking, because we're coming back to your first point, is we're talking about a certain group of people here. How easy it becomes to individualize things when we're still in this mass, uh, you know, like mining or or construction industries or you know the the sweatshops and whatever so whilst we I agree totally with you there's also those parts of the world where it's not going to be as easy as it is to do in others it also comes down to being in the western world let's say we all let's let's assume most of us are in the western world even though we sit here in Africa um, is um, it's easier to do this in in certain countries however what drives those countries? Again, watching this program about um, you know what happened at, at the at, on, on CNN or what happened on sixth of January, it's not so much about uh, the Democrats versus the Republicans anymore. It's about who do you identify with? 
you know, what are those ideas? And, and we need to understand that as well, because if you're identifying with a working class, then how do I create that environment for you to be happy as well? For you to work in an agile manner, if, if that applies at all. Not every single industry is set up for agility. Um, but yeah, Brian, you make some really, I think one of the things again about the agile community is there's so many people in the agile community. And not every single one of them are truly agile. In fact, a lot of them are truly not agile. And please, I'm not talking about anybody in this school. There's nobody that I know here, but a lot of them just take a framework and try to use it as a, as a paint by numbers. And it's not like that. So Miles, we've got five minutes left. And so I was gonna wrap us up, but what I'd like to do is, I've, we just got a really great question from John and, and I'd like him to ask it, but we'll need to keep the answer pretty short to try to fit it in. We do wanna stop on time so people can go. So, so um, John, uh, do you wanna maybe ask that question and we'll get a 60 second answer for Miles and then we'll have to wrap up, yeah. maybe continue the discussion online. Yeah, okay. so it, the, the question comes from uh, talking to someone in a large consultancy a couple of years back who, who said Agile is going to be dead in five years, like Lean, because we're going to kind of uh, drink it dry. So my question, again, it, thinking about startups and thinking about Agile, um, is Agile fast enough to adapt to things or is it now seen as too heavy by people? Is Agile seen as an old fashioned way of doing things? So maybe it is seen as the slower thing and the thing that the older people do is not the thing the smaller startups the smaller kids uh, uh, and it's seen as an old-fashioned so is agile fast enough to adapt um, because the, the smaller organizations don't think they're doing agile they're doing agile but they don't call it agile but john i think you've just actually hit the point right in the head we talk about big a agile and small a agile big a agile is following a framework and that slows things down to some extent Small A Agile is about, you know, I, to, I took one of my dogs for agility training when she was a year old. So if, you, if, if something happens, she turns quickly, she turns quickly. You go back to the business agility, in, I mean, the, the definition of business agility. It's the, the ability to anticipate and adapt to change faster than your competitors. That's a shortened version. So if you're going to follow Agile as a framework and you're going to put in everything that Scaled Agile does, yeah you most probably going to not be as fast as your competitors. But if you've got that, remember Agile is a mindset. It's not necessarily a framework. So if you've just got that mindset, then, 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 you're, then you're good. Love it. I love it, Miles. Thank you so much. And we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I know people probably have other meetings or lunch or things they've got to get to. But just, Miles, I'll say thank you so much for making this presentation. For everyone joining, the recording and the slides Miles mentioned will be available on coachingagilejourneys.com. You can join us there for more events. You can look at past events. Um, we'll just have it up there. So again, Miles, big thank you from all of us. This has been great content. So we really do appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Isaac. And I hope you noticed that I put your logo up on my slide. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, it looked excellent. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> all right, guys, everyone stay safe out there. We'll see you all at a future event. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.